last song we're going to be singing, How Great Thou Art. When Christ shall come with shouts of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, my God, how great thou art. Sing with that fervent prayer this morning, how great thou art.
right. Well, I think it's true that uh, everyone, everyone has some things that you really would rather not talk about. All right. Maybe you're at home. Honey, we need to talk about the finances. Ugh. Uh, maybe, Mom, you ever have your, your child come up and say, um, where do babies come from? And what do you say? Go talk to your father, right? That's where you, that's what you say. Um, maybe uh, you run into an old friend. They ask, how are things going? Um, and you don't want to talk about it because it's not going real well. Hey, how are the kids doing? Eh, the kids aren't doing too well. Hey, are you seeing anybody? Well, you're not. And, you know, it, it, there's topics you don't like to talk about. A lot of times it's topics related to the past, maybe. Uh, past failure. Are there ever stories about your life you wish would just die, but they don't? They keep coming up, and people go, oh, yeah, yeah, remember? Remember when you knocked the wedding cake over? Yeah, it was great. Yeah, yeah well, I wish you'd just shut up. You know what I mean? This is how you feel. I, I did a wedding. I did a wedding one time, and I got the bride's name wrong uh, numerous times. I kept calling her Lisa, and her name was Lori. And, uh, yeah, uh, they don't come to Grace anymore. <laughs> and I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> right? Topics related to the future, too, are hard to talk about. Some of them, you know, hey, do you have a will? Are you preparing for this? Oh, man, details, you know. And um, it can be hard to talk about. Talking about disaster preparations, no, one. <laughs> For the future, I was. It was. It really took me back. I was watching TV just the other night, and and um, a commercial came on, and I thought, "What? I could. I had. I, I couldn't believe what I was watching. They they had this family sitting there eating meals, and and they said, you know, are you prepared for a disaster? And they had some some machine that you could put a meal into it, and it would keep for 25 years. And, and, they, and they said, see this family? They're eating a meal that was cooked 25 years ago. And I'm going, yeah, I'm not buying that. You know, I mean, that, that turkey's not going to look that good after 25 years. But it was a whole idea of, are you prepared for this disaster that could take place? And, you know, anytime there's disaster preparation, there's been conversations in the community or whatever, um, you know, those are hard conversations to, to have, right? Now, we, we know disasters happen. You and I know disasters happen. We just hope and pray they don't happen to us, right? Hopefully and pray they don't happen to us. We know, for example, that uh, there's identity theft. We know that tornadoes just level some houses. We know people get cancer. We know countries are absolute anarchy and they're war-torn. We just hope it doesn't hit home. We just hope it's not our identity that's stolen. We just hope it's not our country that ends up like that. All right? So does, we know disaster happens, but we just don't like to think about it, talk about it, prepare for it, whatever. So here's the deal. When disaster does happen, when it does hit with you, with me, when it does hit home, we're never really prepared for it. We're, we're just not. And it's just the way it is. Typically, we haven't talked about it, or we certainly aren't necessarily prepared for it when it starts to rattle us at the core of what we believe, like when disaster really crashes in in your life, and then you start to ask some questions. Well, where's God in all of this? We, we typically haven't really thought in those levels. You know, where's God in this, and why is this happening to me and is there is there any hope how in the world am i supposed to pick up from this mess and move forward those kinds of questions we typically don't talk about until disaster actually hits well so why am i getting into all this well for the next two weeks we're going to be looking at the old testament book of joel so i'd like you to turn there i'm going to have to give you a head start because even the best of you Bible people are going to have trouble finding the book of Joel. So you can turn there, Old Testament book, very short. It's on page 760 in the Bible in the rack in front of you. So if you want to 
get a head start on everybody, grab a Bible in the rack and turn to page 760. You say, well, Dan, why are you preaching out of the book of Joel? Well, it's in the Bible, right? I mean, that's why we, we, we do the Bible here, right? And, uh, and partly, you know, the bigger picture, um, it is my goal, so you know, it is my goal to preach through every book of the Bible, seriously, to get through the whole thing um, at, at some point. And by the way, I've been at this for a number of years, and I'm down to, we're down to like seven Old Testament books. And many of them are these small, what they're called minor prophets in the Old Testament. So um, I, I'm excited about this. I'm glad to get into the book of Joel. Now, um, Joel was a, a prophet, right? And he had a word from God. That's what prophets do. They get a word from God, thus saith the Lord. And so they're delivering a word into their contemporary setting. These were the B.C. days. And um, Joel is delivering a message in the middle of disaster. In the middle of disaster. Okay? The Israelites were facing disaster. So this is what we're going to learn in the next two weeks is how do you face disaster? We're going to talk about it, about the kind of thing that you don't like to talk about, right? So you say, okay, so what was their disaster? What was so bad? Well, the answer was there was a locust plague, okay? Are you there? Are you in Joel? If, I gave you plenty of time to get there. Are you there? Say, yep. Okay, good. All right, verse 4, Joel 1, verse 4. You say, what was the disaster? Well, here it was. It's the locust. What the cutting locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the hopping locust has eaten. What the hopping locust left, the destroying locust has eaten. Sounds like there isn't anything left, right? The locusts have invaded. In fact, look in verses 6 and 7. For a nation, the locusts are like this cloud that's come. A nation has come up against my land, powerful and beyond number. Its teeth are like lion's teeth, and it has the fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste my vine and splintered my fig tree. It has stripped off their bark and thrown it down. Their branches are made white. These things are still reported of. Occasionally you can find places where locusts invade, and it absolutely destroys a place. So, you know, this is, this is a terrifying thing. I know when I, we made this screen up this week and one of the, the, the ladies in the office said, oh, that's so cute. That's so cute. And, I, you, know, you know, if you were in Israel, this is not a cute picture. This is terrifying. This is absolutely terrifying. The locusts uh, were, were coming. They lived in an agricultural economy, so this was a real and total disaster, right? Our President Trump, President Trump has kind of weakened the word disaster in these latest days because, I mean, he, he labels everything a disaster, right? <laughs> Anything, well, that's a disaster, that's a disaster, oh, this is a disaster. And, and what happens is you go, well, no, this was a disaster, okay? What had happened to the people here in Joel's day was a disaster of historic proportions, Notice verse 1. The word of the Lord uh, came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. And here's what his first words from God. Hear this, you elders. Give ear, all inhabitants of the land. Has such a thing happened in your days? Have you ever seen anything like this before? Or in the days of your fathers? Tell it to your children of it. Let your children tell their children and their children to another generation. So this was huge. I mean, this rocked the place. This was not, wow, the stock market. Well, I really lost a bunch of my investments. No, this was more like the Great Depression. This wasn't, uh, you know, the windstorm knocked out the power all across northern Ohio. Did you hear that this week? All across northern Ohio, you know, the power got knocked out. Oh, it's a disaster. No, this was more like Hurricane Katrina, and the whole city is underwater. You know, Browns fans, Cleveland Browns fans are always talking about the drive and the fumble. That was a disaster, right? But what we're talking about here, disaster, and in Joel's day is more along the lines of 9-11. More along the lines of 9-11. It was the kind of disaster that you marked time.
pine by. It was the kind of thing that happened to everybody. They said, well, where were you when? Do you remember where you were when? And they would fill in the blank. Well, you see uh, Benjamin here? Yeah, he was born. When was he born? He was born the year of the locust plague. Oh, everybody knew when that was. And not only that, everybody, it, it affected everybody. Now, sometimes, you know, in a, in a, okay, can we talk, right? In a strange kind of way, you know, 9-11 happens in New York City, but we in Ashland, Ohio go, wow, that's horrible, that's a disaster, but we live in Ashland. So in a certain sense, it didn't touch us as much, did it? But this touched everyone. This disaster touched everyone. Notice this, verse 9, chapter 1. The grain offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord, and the priests mourn. You know, the agriculture, this was a part of their worship. They came and brought these things. It was a part of their worship, and now there was nothing in worship. And the priests mourn. The ministers of the Lord. The fields are destroyed, and the ground mourns. So there's a personification, kind of like the land is grieving and mourning because the grain is destroyed, the wine dries up, the oil languishes. Verse 11, be ashamed, O tillers of the soil, the farmers, wail, O vine dressers. Why? Because they got nothing. You know, hey, how'd it go this year, right? Farmers are always talking about, hey, how was the harvest? They, they all, they're going, we, we have nothing. Verse 12, the vine dries up, the fig tree languishes, pomegranate, palm, and apple. All the trees of the field are dried up. And listen to this, and gladness dries up from the children of man. Did you, can you try to understand this? Can you try to feel how this touched everyone across the board? They were wrecked by this. Even the party guys, you know, you know, you ever notice some disaster comes by and there's always a group of guys, hey, whatever, let's crack open a few. And, and it's like their, their lives are untouched because they're always just the party guys. Well, guess what? It even hit them. Verse 5, notice verse 5. Awake, you drunkards, and weep and wail, all you drinkers of wine, because of the sweet wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. And so the guys at the frat house are going, hey, things really are bad. Why? We're out of beer. <laughs> there are no more beer. What? No, no, no more beer. And even those guys wake up, right? So this was a disaster, right? This is a, a deep, profound, affecting everyone. And it created this Deep grief, this loss that everyone was feeling. Verse 8, lament. It says, lament. That's a word we don't use much, right? Lament. How? Like a virgin wearing sackcloth for the bridegroom of her youth. So it's like grief. Well, like what? How deeply and profoundly? What kind of loss were all these people experiencing? Well, it's kind of like this. A woman's fiancé died a week before the wedding. And so she's taking her wedding dress back and exchanging it for a black dress to go to a funeral. It's like that. It's like coming home from the honeymoon. And how was the honeymoon? Well, he died in our honeymoon. So do you, you see, I mean, this was a disaster. This was a disaster that touched everyone. It touched everyone deeply. Now, there are some things that nobody wants to talk about, right? There are things that, you know, well, I don't want to talk about it. And then there are times when there are things that everybody's talking about. And that's what this was. I mean, everybody talked about it. And then God speaks into this disaster. God speaks into it. And so for the next two weeks, 
Church, please, the realities in the, in, that can anchor our soul, uh, the hope that we can find as we face disaster, when and if, and maybe it's in your life right now, what's here is, is powerful. It's powerful. God speaks right into the middle, and people were listening because they were living it. So what are those things? We're going to look at it in the next couple of weeks. First of all, well, and hang on, man. I hope you got your head on. I know you didn't get much sleep last night, but, but these things are, are things that we typically don't talk about. First one, point one, is this. Notice that it's the God that brings disaster. The God that brings disaster. Chapter 1, verse 15, Alas, for the day, for the day of the Lord is near, and catch this, as destruction from the Almighty, it comes. Where did this come from? God. Chapter 2 is going to describe, there's some debate, but about if this is an intense uh, recounting of the story of the locusts running around everywhere, or if in fact it's, it's a future development when the armies are going to come and invade Jerusalem. And, and that's a horrific thing that, that would happen in the life of the Israelites. And some most say that that's what Joel's talking about in chapter 2. Listen to how it's described. Man, verse 3, fire devours about armies coming, armies coming, and they're described like locusts. Fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, but behind them it's a desert, a desolate wilderness, and nothing escapes them. Jump down to verse 7. Like warriors, they charge like soldiers. They scale the wall. They, they march each on his way, and they don't swerve from their paths. They don't jostle one another. Each marches in his path. They burst through the weapons and are not halted. They leap upon the city. They run on the walls. They climb up into the houses. They enter through the windows like a thief. The earth quakes before them. The heavens tremble, the sun and the moon are darkened, and the stars withdraw their shining. I mean, do you feel this? This is a disaster that comes and just like a cloud in every crevice of who you are, you're being, it just it invades you down to the core of who you are. But notice verse 11. The Lord utters His voice before His army, for His camp is exceedingly great. He who executes His word is powerful. For the day of the Lord is great and very awesome, and who can endure it? You know what's stunning as you read this and study what's really going on? The, these things in Joel's day were happening to God's chosen people. These things were happening to God's chosen people, and God was claiming responsibility for them. We go, oh, I don't know about it. No, these were, these were real things happening to God's chosen people, and God clearly takes responsibility for them. Hmm. Remember when the tsunami happened and a lot of these things happened? You'll hear people say, well, God didn't do that. God wasn't behind that. God wasn't a part of that. Really? Don't we often refer to a natural disaster as this? What do we refer to natural disasters as? We refer to them as an act of what? God. See, we, we kind of know this. We, we, it's written in the insurance policy, right? We, we kind of know this. Uh, the insurance companies go, hey, this isn't me, man. You've you got to take it up with God. This is an act of God. I remember I got stranded in Chicago one time. I'm flying in, and it's whatever, whatever. Hey, I missed the flight, and I was on your airline. It's your fault. And they go, no, oh, no, man, it's God. It's an act of God. The weather, it was an act of God. Well, you know, God's not going to pay my hotel bill here. I, you know, you guys, anyway, you, you understand what I'm saying? We, we know, but we don't like to talk about it. But if we, 
but listen, you think about this. If you pull the Almighty God out of any involvement with the disasters that crash into our lives, you're left in a really, really bad spot. If you pull the Almighty God out of any involvement in the disasters that hit our lives, then you have to ask yourself, well then what force and power and God is out there bigger than our God that's bringing all this on? And that's frightening. See, this is why in these struggles, this is why some people say, well, either God is sovereign, he is all-powerful, or he's not good, because these are bad things that are happening, or else God is good, he's a good God, but he's just not all-powerful and not sovereign. He's up there going, gee, that was really bad, I'm sorry. This is where people generally land, right? But God is sovereign, and he is good. In the book of Lamentations, the prophet Jeremiah is lamenting. Why? Because he's walking through the, seat, through the streets of his beloved city, Jerusalem, and, and it's smoldering, right? Why? Because the Babylonians have come in, totally destroyed the city, burnt the temple, slaughtered the people. There's blood all over the streets. They've taken those captive, and Jeremiah is walking through the streets, and he's grieving, he's lamenting. And how does he process it? Watch this, Lamentations chapter 3, verses 37 and 38. Where's God in this? His answer, who can speak and have it happen if the Lord has not decreed it? It is not, is it not from the mouth of the Most High that both calamities and good things come? Who's your God? Do you know this God? In the book of Isaiah, God gives these words through his prophet, I am the Lord and there is no other. God says, I'm the Lord and there is no other. And then he says this, is it not, I'm sorry, go back, go back. I, I, got it. I didn't get that. All right. Is it not from the mouth of the Most High? Okay, you, you, you got it right. I'm sorry. Man, I'm all cranked up and you got it right. Watch. I am the Lord, there's no other. And then he says this, I form light and create darkness. I bring prosperity. Well, that's the one we all celebrate. Yeah, God bless it. God bless America. I bring prosperity and create what? Disaster. I, the Lord, do all of these things. God is good, and God is sovereign over all the blessings and all the disasters. And listen, listen, we need a God like this. Otherwise, you live in a world where disasters are just random. Listen, disasters are not an accident. Disasters are not random. The locusts didn't just happen to fly by Jerusalem. Listen, this is not Mother Nature. This is Almighty God, personal and involved. Job is a classic example, right? Job is a, a classic example of someone who faced disaster. Everybody's heard about Job and all the disaster that happened to him. Read carefully how the story unfolds. Read carefully the book of Job, and here's what you will find out. You will find that it was, quote, the fire of God. It was the fire of God that burned up all of Job's sheep and his servants. It also says this, quote, it was Satan who struck Job with loathsome sores. You say, well, there, there is Satan that did it. But read the story. Satan had to get permission before he could ever lay a finger on Job. Now you might go, I don't know if I want to see God that way. I don't know if that's why God... Well, let's interview Job. Let's find out how Job saw the disaster of his life. He's very open how he saw it. Do you remember? When it all crashed down around Job, what did he say? He said, the Lord 
gives and what? The Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job was humbled by this God who even brought disaster. Second, the disaster is described here as the day of the Lord. It's an interesting thing through the book of Joel, this disaster, the day of the Lord is a common theme. Verse one, chapter 1, verse 15, Alas for the day, the day of the Lord is near. Chapter 2, look at chapter 2, verse 1. Blow a trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. Why? For the day of the Lord is coming. It is near, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and, and darkness. The day of the Lord is a major theme in the book of Joel. It's a theme that shows up in the Old Testament. It's a theme that shows up in the New Testament. In the book of 1 Thessalonians 5, God tells believers in the church that the day of the Lord shouldn't come on you like a thief because we ought to have our eyes open and our hearts attuned that this is a part of what God does and how He moves and how He will move in the future. The book of Revelation is the unfolding in detail of the day of the Lord. Now, it's a theme through Joel and, and, and a lot of places. Now, let me back up a second. There are some why questions related to disasters that we'll never know the answer to. Sometimes when disaster comes and hits our lives, there are times that we are tempted to ask why questions that are really a waste of our energy because we'll never get answers. You know, why is this happening to me? And, and why, why is this... You know, well, you know, why is it happening now? Why did it happen to her? We, we just don't know. You know, this is in the mind and the heart of God. But you know what? Don't throw, don't throw it all. Well, don't ask why questions. We never know why on anything. Well, that's not true. God does provide some of the why answers. Some of the insights God does give on what's going on. And in Joel, Joel's message is that this, look, it's the day of the Lord. What's going on with this disaster? Joel said, it's the day of the Lord. That's what's going on. Now, that's not to be confused with the Lord's day. You know, sometimes people call Sunday the Lord's day. This is the, the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord, when you read through it in Scripture, is any time, listen, the day of the Lord is any time when God steps into human history and says, that's enough. And the wicked are judged, the righteous are vindicated, the repentant are forgiven. It's a painful day. It can be a dark thing because God, you know, people running away from God and God goes, that's it. And, and so it's judgment and it's, it's, it's dark and it's painful. And, but the results are justice is established and righteousness is established and it's kind of a reset. God goes, that's enough, and, and he intervenes. The day of the Lord has come. Now, the locust plague was a small sample of that. That's what God wants the people to know. That's part of Joel's message. The, 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 the locust plague, this disaster, what's going on? It, well, it's, it's a small taste of the day of the Lord. It was local, it was national, and it was a wake-up call. Because God's people, when Joel spoke, were living disobedient lives. God's people were living disobedient lives, and they needed to straighten up their act. And so this disaster came, and the people are going, what? And it's the day of the Lord. God intervenes and says, that's enough. Now God's also going to tell the people through Joel that that there's also a day in the future, a day of the Lord, that won't just be local, national with Israel, but in fact is going to be global and involve all of the nations. We need to know this. We need to understand this. And in fact, is yet future from the day that you and I live in. Joel chapter 2, look at Joel chapter 2, verses 30 and 31. 
I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the awesome day of the Lord comes. Look at chapter 3. For behold, in those days and at that time when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all of the nations. This is God talking about a, an event that's yet future to us now in 2017. I will gather all of the nations and I will bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat and I will enter into judgment with them. There on behalf of my people and my heritage Israel because they've scattered them among the nations and have divided up my land and have cast lots for my people Listen to this. God is a God of justice, and someday he's going to say, that's enough. Listen, and this is what, what, what's going on. It's wicked. And they've traded a boy for a prostitute and have sold a girl for wine and have drunk it. God sees everything. Nothing's going to get past him. And he gives us an incredibly long leash, doesn't he? But the day of the Lord is a time when he goes, that's it. Verse 11 of chapter 3, hasten and come. God calls all the nations together, all you surrounding nations, and gather yourselves there. Bring down your warriors, O Lord. Let the nations stir themselves up. They're angry at God. They're rebelling against God. You're going to tell me what to do, and I'm, I'm not living it. And, and so come on, bring it on. And they all come together. All the nations stir themselves up and come to the valley of Jehoshaphat. And there, God said, I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Go in, tread, for the wine press is full. The vat overflows, for their evil is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon are darkened, and the stars withdraw their shining, and the Lord roars from Zion. We just sang, how great thou art. Have you ever seen him like that? He gathers the nations of the world and he roars at their wickedness and he utters his voice from Jerusalem and the heavens and the earth quake. It's the day of the Lord. Disasters... Joel's message from God to the people living in a disaster and facing them is this. Disasters are a good reminder that, by the way, Judgment Day is coming. Judgment Day is coming. And again, these are things that people don't like to talk about. Some people can't accept a God of judgment or a god of wrath people say well my god is a god of love but my god's not a god of judgment well in christianity if you're going to have the biblical god the christian god he represents himself as a god of love but also a god of justice and so people say well how can you put those two things together how can you be a god of love and a god of justice well, if you're a parent, then you, you will understand how some of these things can go together, right? As a parent, if you're a parent, don't you extend love to your children? And also, you want to see justice for your children. If you love a person and seeing some, if you love someone and, and seeing somebody else abusing them or ruining their lives, what do you do? You jump in there, man. You're ticked. You're, you're going to get involved. You're going to say, hey, that's enough, right? Right? Love and justice. If you see your child destroying themselves, certain activities, certain things they're doing that are destructive to their own souls, guess what love does? It steps in there and brings, says, that's enough. I'm not going to let you do this, right? Because in your heart of hearts is love and justice. Becky Pippert, in her book, Hope Has Its Reasons, says God's wrath is not a cranky explosion. It's not the dad that sits there and goes, shut up, I'm trying to watch the TV. No, no, no. It, it, it's not that. It's, it's, God's wrath is not a cranky explosion. It is his settled opposition to the cancer or sin, which is eating out the insides of the human race that he loves with his whole being. It's a settled opposition. God's wrath is a settled opposition against the 
the cancer that's eating out the souls of the people he loves. The day of the Lord. Also, you and I need a firm belief in the day of the Lord. Otherwise, uh, you will be given in to returning evil for evil. Otherwise, you're going to be given in to taking justice and vengeance into your own hands. If you don't believe that the day of the Lord is coming when he says that's enough and he makes everything right and justice is served, then you will be incredibly tempted to step in and fix it now yourself. And, all, and we, the only way we can resist doing that is if we know that there is a God, Almighty God, and the day of the Lord is coming. Marislav Volf is his name. He's a Yale theologian. He, he was a Croatian who saw the violence of the Balkans, and, and it was horrific what went on there, right? And he saw it. He felt it. He was, he was there. And listen to how he processed it in his response. Listen to what he says. This is powerful. Uh, he says, if I don't believe that there is a God who will eventually put all things right, this is the hope of the day of the Lord. I will take up the sword and be sucked into the endless vortex of retaliation. Only if I am sure that there's a God who will right all wrongs and settle all accounts perfectly do I have the power to refrain. We need a God. We need a God. Sovereign God who says, the day of the Lord is near. It's very helpful for us when we're processing the evil and the disaster that rips through our lives. We need the God that Joel describes. We want justice. We want justice against the abuse. Justice again. We want justice. And then, and then all of a sudden we realize, well, wait a minute. If the day of the Lord's coming and judgment day is coming, like, <laughs> do I get a pass? No. What about me? What about you? What about our offenses? What about our day in court? What about when my name's on the docket? Yeah. Romans chapter 14 says this. You then, why do you judge your brothers? Why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. Um, it's written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me. Every tongue will acknowledge God. So then, each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Hebrews 9, 27, it's appointed unto every... Uh, people are destined to die once, and after that to face judgment. The day of the Lord is near. And God will judge the nations, and He will judge us as individuals, and we will, every single one of us, give an account before God. Now, you say, okay, Dan, that's another one of those things I don't want to talk about. Right? What do we do? What do you do? What are you going to do? What am I going to do? What are we going to do? The day of the Lord is near. The day of the Lord is near, Joel says. The day of the Lord is near. What are you going to do? Well, what does God tell us, right? We go back. What are, they, what are we going to do? What does God tell us? Well, thirdly and finally, there's the call of repentance. This is what we do. It's the call of repentance. Chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. Put on sackcloth and lament, O priests. Wail, O ministers of the altar. Go in and pass the night in sackcloth, O ministers of God, because the grain offering is, is withheld. Verse 14. Consecrate a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. This is what you do when you face Disaster in the day of the Lord. Now, God was clear that this disaster happening in Joel's time was because God wanted to get the attention of his people and get them to deal with their sinful ways. God was very clear about that. Do you realize that God also tells us in the New Testament that he still does this with his children? 
If we're believers, our sins are paid for. But if we walk, if we're wandering from God, if we're, if we're pursuing sinful, rebellious ways as a loving Father, He will discipline us. Hebrews 12 says that. And discipline is painful, and it comes from out of God's love for us and desire to see us really live holy lives, really live abundant lives, really live, no, that's not what I created you to live. This is not how I created you to live. Well, I'm, I'm going to do it anyway. Well, I'm sorry, and this is going to hurt. Enough. And he brings these things in our lives. 1 Corinthians 11 is really sobering. There were some believers in the Corinthian church bent on sinning and, and, and not living well for Jesus, and then showing up in church and going through communion, acting like everything was fine. And you know what God told them in 1 Corinthians 11? Yeah, by the way, some of you are sick and some of you die because you're not dealing with your wickedness. Then you say, well, wait a minute, Dan. Does that mean every time somebody gets sick or a disaster comes, it's because we sinned? There's unrepentant sin in our lives? Well, no, 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 no. In John chapter 9, they were walking along, and there's a guy born blind. Remember, the disciples said, so who sinned here, Jesus? Was it him or his parents? And Jesus said, neither. This happens so that the works of God can be made known and glorified. So when disaster comes into your life and mine as believers, is it because we've sinned and God's trying? Not necessarily. Could be because he's going, I'm going to take your life and I'm going to shine through it like I never shined through it before. You want a living example? Megan Stry. See, Job's friends, it was interesting, Job's friends, when you read through the book of Job, guess what they kept saying? Job, you must have sinned somewhere. You must have sinned, man, because these bad things are happening to you. You must have sinned somewhere. And Job says, look, as best I know in my heart, I'm innocent. And that was the conversation back and forth. Because Job's friends had this idea that every time something bad comes, you must have sinned. That's not always the case. So that brings us to the question, how do you know then? Disaster comes into my life, how do I face it? How do I know whether it's because of some unrepentant sin in my life or it's just because I live in a fallen world and these things happen to us? How do you know the difference? Answer, you consecrate a fast. You call for the solemn assembly and you humbly cry out to the Lord and he will tell you. In the case of Joel's day, the people were sinning. They were guilty. Well, what do you do then if disaster comes and I see God and it's, my sin is exposed? What do I do? Well, it's the call to repentance. Look at verses 12 to 17. It's beautiful. Verse 12, Yet now, even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all of your heart and with fasting and weeping and with mourning and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for He is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and He relents over disaster. This is amazing. God offers us repentance. God brings us to repentance. And there's hope of forgiveness and restoration. We're going to get into this more next week. Very briefly, we got to quit. Here's what repentance looks like. It's a change of heart. It's a change of heart. You say, what does repentance really look like? It's a change of heart. God says, you know, rend your hearts and not your garments. Listen, crying and saying you're sorry is not necessarily a sign of repentance. All right? It's just not. Well, they cried and said they're sorry. Trust me, I've been in this for years. Crying and saying you're sorry isn't necessarily sign of repentance. Second, it's a change of direction. Return to me, he says. You're not following God. You're living sinful lives. True repentance means, you know what? Now I'm obeying him. That past sin, I'm not doing anymore. No, I'm not sleeping with my girlfriend anymore. I am living a life of purity. Oh, okay. You have change of direction. Mm -hmm. Oh, I know it's wrong. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, are you repentant? Well, yeah, I told God I'm sorry. Well, are you still sleeping with it? Well, yeah, we're still living together. Well, well, then you're not repentant. Because it's a return to me, it says. 
Third thing is a change of mind. How you see your sin. Too often, sin is just a mistake. It's a slip-up. It's an oversight. It's a sorry, I accidentally hurt you. It's a, I couldn't help it. I, it, it sin is just, well, if, you, know, you understand my background. Sin is, you know, well, this is sin. Well, but it's legal. You say, well, this is legal. Uh, it's consensual. It isn't really hurting anyone else. And God says, enough! It's hurting me. It's hurting me deeply. It's hurting my name. And you're my child, and you bear my name. You see? And people who are truly repentant are broken by these things. They're broken by these things. They sound like chapter 2, verse 17, between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests and the ministers of the Lord weep and say, spare your people, O Lord, and make not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is your God? When we sin as believers and live in open sin and it violates the name and shames the name of Christ and people outside of Christ. They talk and say, yeah, right. You're a Christian? You've been born again? And we shame the name of Christ. And when you are truly repentant, this breaks you. You don't say things, well, it's not hurting anybody else. No, you are broken because it hurts the name of Christ who died for you. So, I end here. Do you know what the greatest news is? The greatest news in the world for a repentant, broken sinner who's facing disaster? Say, wow, this is dark. This is painful. A truly broken... You know what the greatest news in the world is? For a broken sinner facing disaster. It's in Joel. <laughs> Chapter 2, verse 32. And it says this in Joel. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. <laughs> That's amazing. So the God that brings disaster, the God that brings disaster, the Creator and the Lord of the nations who sounds the alarm, the day of the Lord is near, is also the God that the repentant sinner, He's also the God that the repentant sinner finds to be this. Chapter 2, verse 13. He is gracious and He is merciful. He is slow to anger and is abounding in steadfast love. And He relents over disaster. Amazing grace. How can it be that Thou, my God, would die for me? Let's pray. Father, we're going to have to think about these things. I pray that we take this message from Joel and we really get away, get by ourselves, and think through these things. God, please do your work in our hearts and lives. Give us the gift of repentance if we are sinfully running from you. May you break us Break us. Grant us repentance. And then as we come to You, we run to You as we run to You as our only hope. May we find You to be that merciful, gracious, slow to anger and know the steadfast love of someone who's really forgiven. What a beautiful thing. God, thank You for this amazing news in the midst of the dark, dark disaster. In Jesus' name, amen.